Thank you so much for coming to today's panel, The State and the Body, Reproductive Justice and the American Dream. Two small announcements, uh, an apology. We were supposed to have a sign language interpreter here, but unfortunately uh, the person had to cancel. Uh, we are live streaming it and there's closed caption on that if you need that. Uh, and afterwards, uh, I encourage everyone to stay. There's a reception uh, so I, with some food and drink, which is always popular with students, free food. So uh, reproductive justice. Perhaps nothing is more fundamental to the American dream than control over decisions about one's own body. The Declaration of Independence famously said that all are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which implies a fundamental right to bodily autonomy. When the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last year, it sent a shockwave across the nation and made all Americans aware of how that fundamental right was more fragile than anyone imagined. More and more states are enacting strict laws to criminalize activity that was seen as a basic right only a short time ago. The body itself has become yet another battleground in our increasingly polarized nation. But the question of abortion rights is only part of a much larger struggle. This panel will focus on the broader issue of reproductive justice and attempt to place that idea in a rich social and historical context. The session will explore topics beyond abortion, such as access to birth control, gender affirming care, and basic health care, as well as policies and state actions that deny patients their fundamental right to consent. In addition, this panel will highlight the troubling sexual and racial lines that are intimately interwoven into state policies around these questions. The recent court decision may have acted as a catalyst for the public's outrage, but the history of reproductive justice is long and too often tragic. To lead our discussion today, we are very fortunate to have Professor Marjorie Jolis. Professor Jolis's PhD is in philosophy and she's a professor of women's and gender studies at Roosevelt. She has spoken and written widely on the issues related to today's panel. She recently published Slow Motherhood, Utopian Narratives of Time Lost and Found in the Slow Parenting Movement, and Between Embodied Subjects and Objects. She also teaches some of the most interestingly titled courses at Roosevelt and popular courses, uh, The Body, Agency, Pain, and Desire, Fashion, The Politics of Style, The Politics of Sex, What is a Family? She's currently Associate Provost for Faculty Development, Assessment and Honors, as well as the Executive Director of the Honors Program. I'm delighted to turn the proceedings over to my distinguished colleague, Professor Jules. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, and welcome everyone. I'm so thrilled to see such a good turnout on, uh, to attend a panel on such an important, important topic, and I'm so grateful to my colleagues, Professor Andy Trees and Professor Margie Rung, who organized this whole conference and organized this panel. It's an honor for me to moderate this discussion and share the stage with these really brilliant panelists who are each working on the issue of gender justice, reproductive justice in really fascinating and urgent ways. So please join me in welcoming Natalie Lira, who is Associate Professor in the Departments of Latino, Latina Studies and Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. <laughs> Dr. Lira earned her PhD in American Culture from the University of Michigan. Her research interests include the politics of reproduction, histories of medicine, and the ways that struggles for racial and reproductive justice intersect. She's the author of Laboratory of Deficiency, Sterilization and Confinement in California, 1910 to 1950s, a book examining Mexican, origins, Mexican origin peoples' experiences of eugenic sterilization and institutionalization in California during the first half of the 20th century. Dr. Lira is also co-director of the Sterilization and Social Justice Lab, an interdisciplinary research collaborative that studies the history of eugenic sterilization in the United States. Funded in part by a grant from the National Institutes of Health, the SSJL team uses mixed methods from the social sciences, humanities, and public health to explore patterns and experiences of eugenic sterilization in California, Iowa, North Carolina, Michigan, and Utah. To my far right, Kidsia Sharif is an organizer 
birth worker, and reproductive justice advocate currently serving as the de deputy director of the Chicago Abortion Fund. In 2019, Kidsia joined CAF as a program coordinator where they quickly demonstrated their commitment to reproductive autonomy and justice. Her strategic vision was instrumental in expanding CAF's capacity to provide logistical, financial, and emotional support to every single person it reaches through its helpline seeking abortion care in Chicago, Illinois, across the Midwest, and beyond. Today, Kidsia is a leading voice in the, abor in, in the abortion access movement, working to build a world where everyone has access to the resources, care, and support they need to thrive. Kidsia is unapologetically black, queer, feminist, and anti-capitalist politic informs all aspects of her work, from the policies she advocates for to the way she shows up for the people she serves. In the center, yes, welcome. Deborah Turkheimer is the class of 1967 James B. Haddad professor at Northwestern University's Pritzker School of Law. She joined the Northwestern Law faculty in 2014 after serving as professor at DePaul University College of Law since 2009 and the University of Maine School of Law since 2002. She teaches and writes in the areas of criminal law, evidence, and feminist legal theory. Professor Turkheimer is the author of Credible, Why We Doubt Accusers and Protect Abusers, and Flawed Convictions, Shaken Baby Syndrome and the Inertia of Injustice. She's also a co-author of numerous articles on sexual violence and domestic violence. After clerking for Alaska Supreme Court Justice Jay Rabinowitz, she served for five years as an assistant district attorney in the New York County District Attorney's Office, where she specialized in domestic violence pro prosecution. In 2015, Turkheimer was elected to the American Law Institute, an esteemed group of judges, lawyers, and legal scholars dedicated to the development of the law. She received her undergraduate degree from Harvard College and her JD from Yale. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome all. So this panel engages the concept of reproductive justice, which is distinct from reproductive rights. It's an important distinction. So I thought as our first question to open things up, I would ask each of our panelists to say how you understand this concept of reproductive justice and what can it do for us as a concept? And I thought, Kitsia, we could begin with you. Sure. Yes, um, I can definitely talk about reproductive justice. To me, and I think for a lot of people, my understanding of reproductive justice is rooted and reflected by in Sister Song's um, organization and their definition of reproductive justice, which centers our so that brings a human rights um, analysis to what we would understand as a reproductive rights framework, understanding that just because we have the legal right to accessing an abortion or starting a family or taking care of our family, that, that doesn't necessarily mean we have the ability to. Um, and so I understand reproductive health framework as you know trying to deliver direct care to people, reproductive rights about the legal framework and reproductive justice, again, bringing in a human rights framework to understand that we need to create the conditions for people to actually be able to act and realize on their rights. Thank you. Yeah. Natalie, care yeah. to chime in? Of course, just building on Katia's answer, you know, um, as a scholar, um, and a student of reproductive justice, uh, I've learned that uh, reproductive justice is a movement, right? So it's a movement for um, a broadening of reproductive politics that includes access to healthcare, that includes um, uh, analyzing and intervening in legal policies, um, but that it's also a praxis um, and it's an analysis, which is 
uh, extremely important for me in my work, right? And so the an analytical part is built on the kind of three pillars of reproductive justice, which folks might be familiar with. Um, and the three pillars are, you know, the right to not have children, right? The right to have access to contraceptive methods, um, the right to terminate a pregnancy, but also the right to have children, right? Um, the right to be free from things like sterilization abuse, and also the right to parent and to um, be supported in forming the families that we want and um, to live in environments that allow us uh, to flourish, right? Environments that are safe and free from violence. And all of these things are really built on um, you know, notions of bodily autonomy, but also sexual autonomy. Mm -hmm. And so in a, in a kind of scholarly sense, for me, those pillars and those fundamental um, points within the reproductive justice framework are what guide me in my historical research, what guide me in my analyses of things like, you know, sterilization abuse um, and other um, histories of reproductive politics. Um, another thing that I would add is that reproductive justice, you know, integrates this human rights framework, but it's also really um, built on an understanding of intersectionality, right, and the fact that people, um, people's experiences of reproduction and their experiences of fertility um, are shaped by their subjectivities, by race, by class, by ability, by age, right? And so those are kind of the, the main things that I think of when I think of reproductive justice as a framework for scholarship, for praxis, and as a, a movement. Um, building on everything that's been said, which is difficult because so much has been said, um, I want to go back to the 90s and think about kind of what space this was filling. Um, the movement had been, the movement for reproductive rights mm -hmm. had been largely directed by and driven by the concerns of white women in sort of middle and upper class um, America. And what that left out was, yes, the concerns of the black feminists who started the reproductive justice movement, um, but also people um, you know, who had a different immigration status, different ability status. And you know, we can go all the way down the line to sort of think about the ways in which these marginalized statuses and social groups had been left out of this conversation. Um, as a practical matter, what the right leaves out is, yes, access, but it also leaves out this broad array of issues that we now understand fall under the umbrella of reproductive justice. So the right to have children, the right not to have children, the right to raise children in a safe, dignified, equal environment, right? And so I wanna be really concrete about this and give you a sense of what a reproductive justice class covers in a law school because that's where I teach. So we're thinking about the ways in which the state or the law constrains these abilities that I you know, just described, to have children, to not have children, to raise those children in the right kind of environment. So yes, abortion, contraception, sterilization, pregnancy discrimination, mm -hmm. healthcare, maternal mortality, the criminalization of pregnancy outcomes, um, thinking about reproductive surveillance, thinking about reproduction in carceral settings and other detention settings. And so always centering those most vulnerable, most marginalized individuals and their concerns in order to build out a framework and a very practical response to all of those pressures and all of those forces that are limiting the ability of these folks to control their sexual and reproductive capacities. Wow, I mean, you really lead us beautifully to look at the other part of the title of this panel, which is the body and the state. So Deb, what you were just saying really sets the stage for studying like, well, what is that relationship? So certainly uh, the fields of feminist theory, critical race theory, disability studies, and on and on, understand that the relationship between the body and the state is often one of struggle. We use the word constraint. So each of you does work looking at that struggle, that area, that relationship between the body and the state. And so I thought I would ask if you could 
tell us what you know, what you've seen or studied or what you work on around how folks navigate that struggle of embodied life and the relationship to the state. Natalie, I can start with you. Sure. Um, so, you know, my uh, almost more than 10 years of work in specifically looking at sterilization abuse uh, illustrates kind of, or I have learned that um, reproductive oppression um, occurs kind of on a spectrum. And so I've looked at one of the extreme examples, which is forced or, co or co coerced or mandated sterilization um, coming from the state. And so, you know, my research looks at uh, the sterilization of Mexican origin people, primarily young men and women who were sterilized in um, situations of confinement when they were institutionalized in state institutions. And so um, in those instances, we see the way that the state has drawn on um, racist, classist, ableist ideas to justify um, why someone is unfit to be a parent, why they should be sterilized, why they should be denied the right to parenthood. Um, but another huge lesson that I've learned in looking at these really um, difficult histories of reproductive violence is that people have always um, sought to establish their um, auto reproductive autonomy. So even in context of extreme control where the state has decided that, for example, a youth needs to be confined in an institution and needs to be sterilized, um, often against their own will, but against also against the will of their parents, um, that folks find ways to contest and resist those practices, right? That they find ways to escape from the institution, that they, their families find ways, they find allies in, in churches, right? Um, um, several folks uh, in my research have reached out to, for example, the Mexican consulate or other community allies, right? Have sought to um, contest the sometimes overwhelming power of the state, but um, have also found ways to resist in really creative, um, um, uh, and have taken creative approaches to, to that. And so I think what's really important in looking particularly at histories of, of um, reproductive oppression, and this is not just with sterilization abuse, but also history of um, abortion, histories of contraception, that people have always sought to you know, um, establish their own agency and their own autonomy over their reproduction, in, even in contexts of, of control and oppression against the state. And I think we, we have a lot to learn from those practices, um, individual practice, but, but also collective practices. Mm -hmm. So I think those are kind of the two main lessons that I've, I've learned in doing this research. Kitsia, talk to us about how you see folks navigating that struggle between the state and embodiment, the different forms embodiment can take. How, how do you encounter that in your work? Yeah, that's a great question. And I was sitting here thinking as you were talking, I feel like it's, I mean, it's essential integral to, to everything we're doing in, with the Chicago Abortion Fund, we're providing direct support to people that are seeking support, whether they're an Illinois resident or not, at this point, folks are having to navigate and circumvent mm -hmm. barriers to accessing care, which are, I think, for the most part, can be tracked back in some way to the state, even with, we talk about abortion stigma as a huge barrier that's not measurable or tangible, maybe, mm -hmm. in the ways where a law is, but the impacts of abortion stigma keep people from being able to access their support networks and reach out for support, make it, and now with increased criminalization and surveillance, like being scared to Google what your options are or send a Facebook message, a private Facebook message with your parent. Um, the fact that people are having to cross state lines um, and fearing license plate readers, all of these things are tangibly, you know, by laws able to, in Illinois at least we're trying to address them with tangible situations, I mean, tangible solutions, yeah. but it's the culture shift work that we're equally committed to, I think is so, so important and something that each and every person can have an impact through. Um, so I see that as, as a lesson in a place by creating 
a space with the people that you know in your life, in your community, however small or large, that you are a safe space, a resource, um, really does, especially now, make a tangible difference in helping people navigate barriers and restrictions to care. Thank you, and I appreciate your attention to culture. Mm -hmm. And Deb, I'm thinking about your work around um, the struggle to have the authority over one's own experience, the struggle to be believed, the struggle to know that I know what happened to my body and how that uh, ha has to, sometimes there's a lot that has to be overcome in order to be believed. So I'm curious if you could tell us about how you see people navigating that particular mm. struggle. Yeah, thank you. And I also um, really love the connection between culture and law, which I think is one that you know we really ought to be interrogating. There is this very close reciprocal relationship between the way the law responds to, let's say in this case, gendered harms, mm. right? And the way our culture does. And so you know, I think we kind of need to be toggling back and forth between these two very powerful forces and not kind of just being really myopic about looking at one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of my work has focused on credibility um, in the sexual violence context, but in others as well. Um, I, you know, I argue that credibility is actually a form of power and it gets um, sort of distributed along very familiar axes of power in our society. And um, that's you know, n you're not gonna be the case in every single instance, but if we're looking at patterns, we ought to realize that there, there are these kind of very um, commonplace responses to people who come forward and assert um, that something happened, right? And if that person tends to lack social power um, in our society, it's going to be the case that they are less likely to be believed they are also more likely to be blamed for whatever the harm is. And, and I think this part is critical and it goes to everything that's been said already today. There's a care gap, right? And so it's not just that we tend to doubt that something happened um, or that the, 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 the person who did the harm is to blame, but we also just don't care as much about violation when the person who has been violated um, you know, again, doesn't have that kind of social power. Mm -hmm. And so I say this, um, my focus has been sexual violence, but I think it relates very much to the topic of, the, of this panel and thinking about bodies and thinking about, um, you know, what we experience and when those experiences find uptake in our culture mm -hmm. and in our law, and then when the opposite is true. Um, and so that's kind of a theme that I think runs through you know, everything that, that everyone up here on this stage is, is trying to, to do in our work is, is to examine um, the ways in which, you know, this power gets distributed and, and frankly to disrupt those ways as well. I love the connections that are surfacing here between care and power. We don't often think of them as sort of twin phenomena, but they really are. And that leads me to my next question. So. As we know, and as Professor Trees mentioned at the top, in 2002, the US Supreme Court found that there is not a constitutional right to abortion, which overturned just shy of 50 years of precedent. So this ruling, Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, um, set in motion a kind of dizzying reality that we are in right now. So we have uh, they, the court returned this decision to the states. So we have some states where abortion is legal, some states where it's illegal. Who counts as a person <laughs> varies from state to state. Kitsia, I imagine you're at, on the front lines of this because of where we live. Can you tell us a little bit about what this means for Chicago, Illinois? The fact that now uh, abortion is not guaranteed federally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think first to answer the question, I want to go back to and, and name that Roe also, like having Roe in place didn't right. mean that across the country people had access to abortion. Mm -hmm. Right after the Roe v. Wade decision, there was the Hyde Amendment introduced um, by actually an Illinoisian 
senator mm. or someone. Um, and the Hyde Amendment restricted any federal funding for paying for abortion care. So anyone on Medicaid or government employees, all folks, their insurance is restricted. And that created automatically an inequality in terms of who could access abortion care. And he, I forget his name, which is fine. He <laughs> really clearly stated that he wanted to ban all abortion, but this is the best that he could do. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, people have struggled, you know, regardless of the legal right to access abortion. And Illinois has, for a while, been an access point for the Midwest. And now, post the Dobbs decision, is really a national access point for people that need abortion care. And Chicago, as a city, um, as a municipality has invested in Chicago Abortion Fund, in other abortion providers, and we hope continue to you know, dig into asserting that Chicago is a place that will not only support Chicagoans and Illinoisians, but also our neighbors that need to rely on us in this moment. And so since the Dobbs decision, Chicago Abortion Fund has supported over 13,000 people from across um, 40 states, 40 different home states. So again, Chicago and Illinois is a national access point because um, we've also got downstate Illinois um, where there's clinics just across from St. Louis um, and then also in, in Carbondale, Illinois. So, and as we saw since Dobbs decisions, more bans come down. Indiana is no longer a state where you can access abortion care. And recently, although Planned Parenthoods in Wisconsin have started providing care, um, that's still only two clinics in a whole state, and their capacity is not able to meet the full need in the state. So Wisconsin folks are still relying on Illinois and Minnesota as another access point mm -hmm. in the Midwest. Um, so we're really digging in. Like I, I can say Chicago Abortion Fund is digging into building our infrastructure to meet the moment, and we were beforehand, right? We knew that Roe was going to fall. We knew before the leak of the decision. Right. And we were preparing and we were building and you know trying to get attention, saying that this was coming. And now we're here and really hoping that folks see and recognize that we need to invest in the long haul because we know it will be a long haul fight. Yeah. Um, and we need to meet people's need right now in addition to building long term. And that's part of the central way that Chicago Abortion Fund approaches our work is um, to pull from the national network of abortion funds, funding abortion and building power. We know we need to build power for the long term change and cultural shifts that we know need to happen. And we need to meet people's need right now. Thank you. I mean, there's that power care combination yet again so something really interesting has happened since Dobbs. Mm -hmm. Kitsia, you mentioned all these trigger laws that went into effect right away, states outright banning abortion. However, in the sphere of direct democracy, every time since the summer of 2022, when a ballot initiative that either protects or expands abortion access. Every time abortion has been on a ballot initiative in the last year and a half, it has won. And notably in so-called red states. So this is a fascinating, I think quite unexpected, outcome of the Dobbs ruling. And so Deborah, I'm wondering if you could tell us, how, what do you make of this complicated relationship that the American electorate is in with the US Supreme Court, which is notably not an elected body, or maybe more barely indirectly elected, if you can connect the dots between a presidential election and uh, the Supreme Court nominations. So what are we to make, how are we to make sense of what's happening on, in direct democracy and then this reality at the Supreme Court? Right, and abortion rights are, are, are broadly supported by the American people to this point. Um, one interesting um, uh, component of the court's decision and Dobbs is that the, the justices kind of nodded to this idea that democracy was sort of the way to resolve this. And yet at the same time, many of the court's recent decisions 
have um, allowed for a whole lot of gerrymandering to, um, you know, to sort of pass legal muster. Mm -hmm. And so there's this sort of tension between the court saying, you know, let, you know, let the voters kind of figure this out. And then at the same time, the fact that we do have these, you know, very sort of problematic districts that make kind of, as you say, direct democracy a little bit less direct than we might like mm -hmm. to think it is. So that's why I find these, um, you know, these ballot initiatives to be really interesting because when voters are able to themselves speak not through their elected representatives, but you know, with their own voices, um, such as they are, we are seeing that there's some greater protection of the right to abortion than, um, than we might have otherwise feared when the, when the court sort of throws up its hands and says, like, let, you know, let, let's let the voters kind of figure it out. So I just want to kind of point out that we should, again, all be watching not just the court's decisions related to um, abortion and, you know, and, and, and maybe we'll talk about gender affirming care and the like, but also its decisions related to democracy, because our democracy is very much implicated in this idea that the voters are just going to kind of be able to implement their will. It is far more complicated than that. And I have to say the court is, is making it even more difficult for, for us to see that, um, that promise realized. Indeed, yes. Democracy sounds great. And then when you read the fine print, right, and you realize that, well, districts are being carved up in such a way that the party is choosing its voters and not the other way around. Yeah, and I mean, the other thing to point out, and I don't have to tell anyone here this, um, you know, we are a, a deeply polarized nation. Um, and, you know, some of that has to do with social media and some of that has to do with, with other dynamics and other forces. But, you know, it, it just isn't, I, I think it isn't the case that for the court to kind of punt and say, well, let, you know, this is from the opinion, um, women have political power. So we're going to get out of this business and let, you know, let the, you know, the sort of voters figure it out while the court's going to hear another case involving um, abortion medication mm -hmm. this term in all likelihood. And, you know, there's lots of litigation around this. It's just not that easy to say we're going to kind of absent ourselves from this question. Mm -hmm. And I think to, to jump in, I think it's, it's disingenuous to say that even without gerrymandering that a, a democratic system as it works now will actually work if equity doesn't exist in society if because there's still other ways that people's ability to vote is being restricted. And so if it is being said, oh, let's put it to a vote, and that doesn't acknowledge the fact that not everyone who is impacted mm -hmm. by the ability even has the ability to vote, let alone the, the access and support maybe that they need to vote. Um, right. Yeah. Right. So many layers of this relationship between the self and the state. And, and the embodied self and the state. And that brings me to thinking, Natalie, about your work. And let's talk a little bit about birth control. Um, last week, two weeks ago, the economist Claudia Golden won the Nobel Prize for Economics. And she was her work uh, really links the advent of accessible birth control to women's success in the workplace. And birth control is hailed as this essential ingredient of women's liberation and women's agency to have lives beyond the narrow confines of compulsory motherhood. That, of course, is when birth control is chosen, mm -hmm. right? So tell us a bit about your work that, that, that might reveal different sort of histories of birth control, especially as they interact with the racial composition of the US. Yeah, so um, that, that's. So my newer work is actually looking at this kind of history or the widening of access to birth control, which occurs at the federal level in the 1960s. Um, and so, you know, a lot of economists will argue that when the federal government um, invested in access to birth control, you know, um, then all of these wonderful, there's this mm -hmm. very, um, beautiful narrative that's drawn of, you know, li women's liberation and, and an increase in women's rights. Um, but really, federal programs for birth control were tied to the notion that 
um, birth control is a way, a tool to address issues of poverty, right? Um, and when people who can get pregnant decide to access birth control, that is, you know, one way that they can exercise their reproductive autonomy. But historically, we've seen that certain uh, methods of birth control have been, you know, used in coercive ways by the state, right? And so, for example, the development of the birth control pill, the first versions of the birth control pill were actually tested on Puerto Rican women in, in Puerto Rico, low-income Puerto Rican women in Puerto Rico. But actually, that's not the population that was able to access the birth control pill when it rolled out because you need to often have a primary care provider, right, to get a prescription for birth control pills. Um, IUDs were developed um, in a lot of ways to address um, concerns over overpopulation. Um, so an IUD, an intrauterine device, is one of many kind of long-acting um, birth control um, uh, technologies. Um, and so the idea is that you insert an IUD and that will um, allow you to prevent pregnancy, right? Um, and so IUDs were often um, pushed on certain populations um, with the idea that they're easy to insert, but actually to get them taken out uh, without a plan to get them taken out, right? And so the idea is that if we can intervene in the lives of low-income people, um, people of color, and um, make it so that they have to um, access birth control in these ways, then they, this will prevent reproduction, right? And then this will prevent uh, poverty. And this link between reproduction and poverty or the use of contraceptives to prevent poverty is an idea that was really developed during the eugenics era in the, 19, um, in the early 20th century, right? It was this idea that um, if we could only just prevent um, unfit populations from reproducing, then we can address large scale social mm -hmm. problems like crime, like mor immorat immorality, like um, poverty. Um, and that's not the way that these large-scale social issues <laughs> come about, right? We know that large-scale social issues like poverty are caused by our economic system, not by people having children, right? And so the, that logic that, you know, birth control is, is equal to, you know, poverty prevention has actually been very damaging for folks and has... Um, created and justified social policies that have restricted people's reproductive um, autonomy. Um, and so those kind of very nice celebratory narratives around contraception are actually much more complicated. Um, and so, you know, I think we still link, you know, poverty prevention to access to contraception without really um, highlighting the fact that you know, access to contraception within a reproductive justice framework also means that people have the knowledge to choose the type of contraception that they want, that it not be, for example, an IUD, um, that, it can, that it can be any of the contraceptive options, um, but also that they um, can have children um, even if, with, with access to social supports, right, that they have the right to parenthood, right, that just because you're low income doesn't mean that you shouldn't have children. Right, because often, especially now, right, having children is linked to, you know, having the funds to support a family, right? That is kind of the logic, um, and that's very classist, capitalist logic, so. Can I just connect this up to what Please. we talked about at the very beginning of the conversation, which is like the move from um, reproductive choice to reproductive justice, because, you can see how if you just locate um, an issue or a problem or a challenge in the individual and you don't pull back and sort of see this individual in a web of structures and social hierarchies, right? You're missing almost the entire story, right? And so like by, by doing the opposite and by kind of pulling back and seeing these layers of um, you know, power differentials and socially situatedness, right? That's where you start to glimpse um, not only the, the full extent of the problem, but also perhaps a way toward, uh, you know, a, a better solution or sort of a better, fuller, more just response. Right, I mean, thinking of reproductive justice as really an analytic tool 
that will make visible the structures that otherwise are pretty invisible. I mean, we don't see always, um, you know, things that we consider structures. We just live out our individual lives, but of course, our lives are made possible by and constrained and enabled by those structures simultaneously. So I'm appreciating what reproductive justice can do for our understanding, for what it is we can see. And so, you know, this conference is the American Dream Reconsidered. What is American <laughs> about reproductive justice? Or maybe I could put the question this way. What do national borders have to do or not do with reproductive justice? You could see, I'll throw that to you. I mean, I think in some ways right now they mean a lot and they don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. I think national borders, people are having to travel to the United States to access abortion care right now. There are also other places across the country where it's easier to access abortion, maybe say, than in Indiana or even in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's hard to it's hard to think about reproductive justice, especially without thinking about a, a transnational understanding of reproductive justice, mm -hmm. um, and understanding the ways that borders do have an impact on what people can do and access. So I'm just thinking about how we, at the Chicago Abortion Fund, are really intentional about not wanting to recreate the barriers that state borders, for example, are creating for people's ability to access. So even though we are the Chicago Abortion Fund and we're Illinois Statewide Abortion Fund, we will support anyone who calls us and try to figure out mm -hmm. if we are the fund to support or if we're not, how to connect them to the support that they need. Um, and so I feel like that's what the reproductive justice lens lends us <laughs> when thinking about state borders and, and also national borders in terms of what people, what options people really have right now. Um, and like I think about living on the south side of Chicago, I'm closer to Indiana than I am to mm -hmm. Rogers Park, mm -hmm. but the options that my neighbor in Gary, Indiana has, ver Indiana has versus the person in Rogers Park are very different. Right, yet again, the state, you know, that intimate relationship of the state and our, and, and our embodied life, mm -hmm. for sure. Other thoughts about the Americanness <laughs> of reproductive justice? What, what can we understand by thinking about those two things together? Um, I mean, I think, you know, this question makes me reflect on what we were talking about earlier and like the reproductive justice, the founders of the reproductive justice movement and the concept made the decision to ground their concept in human rights out of a recognition that American institutions were often in uh, falling short mm -hmm. in ensuring um, that all people in the country were able to live out their um, fundamental rights to reproduce, to have children, um, to form families in safe and sustainable environments. And so that kind of like thinking globally really opened a lot of um, uh, op, uh, imaginaries for them, right? Mm -hmm. Ways to envision um, techniques to you know, use within the movement and organizing and in advocacy and thinking about this culture shift and different ways to build communities and structures outside of the law and outside of American institutions like the Supreme Court, um, but also like encourage people to, you know, figure out how to navigate these institutions in creative ways. Um, but the question also makes me think of, you know, the history of you know abortion networks and and the long history of Americans going to, for example, Mexico to access abortion um, before Roe v. Wade and now, mm -hmm. right? Because you know people have decided to decriminalize abortion, right? And so, what does that mean? And and what can we learn 
um, and thinking across, globally and grounding our you know, American dream in kind of more human rights analyses and to allow us ourselves to learn from other countries. Like I think you know, traditionally we would think that Mexico, because of these stereotypes around uh, other countries, that you know, the US is more pro progressive and things like human rights and women's rights, but the opposite is kind of happening. And so what do we have to learn? Um, from thinking about across these borders, right? How can we push the American dream to live up to these kind of principles and, and, and make them a reality? Um, I'll make a culture point and a law point. The culture point is that we are so accustomed, I think, as Americans to thinking in individualistic terms and to thinking in capitalistic terms where we privatize decision making and we are, Maybe, maybe learning um, to to sort of think more structurally and 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 to sort of see those social webs that we're all up here talking about, but it's a challenge and it I think uh, forces us maybe to lean into the reconsidered part of the um, you know American dream. On the law side. Um, yeah, we have a Supreme Court that has, in Dobbs, made very clear that the way it interprets the Constitution is to look to history and traditions at the time of the nation's founding and framing and ratification of these amendments. And you know, to, to, to sort of be blunt about it, that leaves out a whole lot of, of folks and a lot of interests. And so you're sort of freezing in time a certain set mm -hmm. of understandings, a certain set of um, uh, 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 visions as to who matters and who doesn't. And so, you know, from the perspective of people who are wanting a more egalitarian, just society, that's of concern. Um, and so, here again, I'd say reconsidering some of this American dream is going to be really important and looking outside of our own narrow borders and, and, and sort of familiar parameters, that's where we're, I think, probably gonna find a lot of inspiration to move past some of these um, profound limitations, both in culture and in law. Thank you. So I have a bit of like a lightning round question to wrap us up before we turn to your questions. So, it feels to me like we are in a very like uh, chaotic, dizzying time. So pregnant people just lost a fundamental constitutional right. It's now illegal to provide gender affirming healthcare in some parts of the country. Um, at the same time, most abortions occur outside of clinics. They occur at home through medication. Although as Deb mentioned, that might be imperiled uh, this year, we'll see. And the FDA just approved the very first over-the-counter oral contraceptive pill, which I think will have, it will be transformative. I mean, we don't know, but that is a, a, a campaign that has been fought for decades and decades. So a lot is going on right now. And in some ways it feels like the technology is outpacing our politics. I mean, it's hard to know really what to focus on. So I thought in the spirit of a lightning round, I could ask each of you, like, what's the most urgent issue for you? Given that you work in different areas, direct action and abortion care, law and legal theory, histories of reproductive justice and medicine, what is the most urgent issue for you right now that you're working on in the area of reproductive justice? And whoever is ready to speak can speak. I'll say for me, um, from my perspective as a scholar, as an, as an academic, I think the most urgent thing is um, taking seriously the framework of reproductive justice in the different kind of ways, in the ways that we analyze um, reproductive politics, um, in the ways that we move in terms of supporting organizations um, and in kind of the praxis part, like what does reproductive praxis mean? Like how do I act and live out my, um, my connections and beliefs in um, ensuring reproductive freedom for folks? Like, and, and where, 
you know, what I tell my students is like, you don't have to do everything, but you can find your like niche, right? Like you can find your organization that you're gonna support either through volunteering or through donating money, right? You can find your research that you're gonna do, right? Like everyone has a, has a role to play. And so I think kind of in my position, I, what's most urgent and what I try to do in my classes is like teach the framework, like help us think about how it can be applicable, like how can it be applied? How do we support these pillars? Um, and how do we think creatively, um, given, given the knowledge that we know that things like our Supreme Court, the rights that are you know, given to us, or that the Supreme Court is not going to hold on to our rights in the way that we thought they might, right? Um, and so that's kind of the most urgent thing for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, you know, I think a lot can be done at the local level, and so whether it's community organizing or whether it's sort of thinking through how we educate, um, you know, people who are very young and then people who are young adults, but I think a lot of this does um, kind of hinge on the future of our democracy, and I define that really broadly to say, like, who is going to be able to vote, who's going to have access, not as just a legal matter, but also the wherewithal um, mm -hmm. to, you know, to, to make this kind of change. Because I, I do see a lot of potential for a brighter future, but I think that there, there's so much that has to happen to kind of seed that ground, um, S-E-E-D, not C-E-D-E, right? -E, right? <laughs> um, and so, it, I don't know if this is a fair answer to the question, but I think that's where I'm putting a, a, a lot of my hope and energy now, less so at the kind of highest levels of the Supreme Court litigation and more so kind of at the, um, the, the early, early end and sort of what are we, um, what, what is the pipeline looking like for mm -hmm. people who are coming, coming of age and going to be, I hope, future voters? I think my answer is kind of like yours in that I think this moment really demands that we center the reproductive justice framework and see every social issue that we're facing with a reproductive justice lens because otherwise we're missing it. We're missing mm -hmm. a huge piece. Um, and like I was talking about fund abortion, build power, I think that's, that's a big part of what grounds Chicago Abortion Fund in the reproductive justice framework that we know we can't, like, I don't like the, and we don't identify as a charity. Like, we're not about just, I mean, we are about giving money to people because people deserve money, but not just that. It's about making change because our long-term goal is that we don't need to exist, that people have all the resources right. Right. that they need to sustain their families and get the abortions they want and get the assisted fertility support that they want and get the gender-affirming care they want. So, um, I think that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does, it does. And I want to thank each of you individually and together for such a wide-ranging conversation. I also want to point out to our students uh, the great value of what we call interdisciplinary inquiry. So what we can learn from bringing a historian and a legal theorist and a community activist together, what gets illuminated when we have those diverse perspectives engaging around a single concept or theme, and I'll just mention that that is an academic uh, innovation that we have feminist scholars to, to, to thank for. So that's just a plug for women's and gender studies, where this is sort of, this is what inquiry looks like. So thank you all so, so much. I'm happy to turn the conversation over to all of you and hear your questions, and I'll talk less. <laughs> Uh, thank you all so much for that. Um, so one of the things I kept hearing was, you know, class as being one of the most prohibitive ways of reproductive justice, having folks having access and things like that. But I keep thinking about the relationship between institutions like religion being so important to our culture and to our laws. And I'm wondering, from your various perspectives, if you can speak to how religion is playing into and the different kinds of religious institutions are playing into these questions of reproductive justice. But thank you all, this was awesome. Mm -hmm.
I mean, religious institutions wield a lot of power and money. Money is power in a capitalist society. So the first thing that I thought of is funding crisis pregnancy centers or fake clinics, um, which are fake clinics. In Illinois, we have more crisis pregnancy centers than we do abortion providers, hmm. abortion clinics um, in Illinois. And in other states, it's even worse. So, and those are, I mean, they're not just funded by religious institutions, um, also by the state. Um, but the other piece is by impacting culture and how we think about reproductive choice. And like I, we talk a lot about abortion stigma, but also pregnancy is stigmatized, period. Mm -hmm. Unintended pregnancy is stigmatized. Most people feel, I mean, I can't speak for how people feel, but um, in our society, unintended pregnancy is meant to be like, something you don't feel great about. Um, and that then builds upon um, abortion stigma. And I think that religious dogmas and ideas, but also organized community and organized money really does impact people's ability to access care. And also sometimes, a lot of times actually we support people through Chicago Abortion Fund who are being supported by their mm -hmm. religious communities. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think it's important not to say that like all anti-abortion people are Christians, and that's a lot of times where in I think like pro-choice community we fall, we fail in terms of really using the reproductive justice framework to actually analyze all the the powers in, in place. I'll let someone else talk. I mean, I, just to make a, a pretty global statement, the Supreme Court, you know, when it comes to clashes between the right to, to, to freely exercise your religion and then equality-based claims has mm -hmm. leaned very hard in the direction of, of religion, right? And so um, that cashes out in lots of different ways in the reproductive justice or in abortion, reproductive justice, gender affirming care, like all sorts of different places where we see this um, real respect for slash veneration of religion um, and, you know, at the cost of, you know, what proponents would say are just, you know, basic equality claims. Mm -hmm. um, now, it, it's interesting, it'll be interesting to see how cases involving folks who are arguing that they're right to exercise their religion is coming into conflict with restrictions yeah. and bans on abortion, right? How the courts litigate that. So, you know, it can get scrambled in all sorts of really interesting ways, but if we're just looking at sort of where the Supreme Court is coming out on this, heavy thumb on the scale of religion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll just add quickly, yeah, like that um, religion has been um, deliberately mobilized to create a polarized um, discourse around uh, abortion, like specifically with the creation of this idea of a moral majority and, and evangelicals taking up abortion as kind of a way to um, sway voters and grow their, you know, voting base. Um, so, you know, we, we see that happening. Surprisingly, you know, abortion wasn't this huge, um, polarized issue before Roe v. Wade, or even when Roe v. Wade was decided. It was, cre this discourse around abortion was created, um, you know, at the specific moment in time with the creation of this idea of a moral majority as a voting base. But I wanna add too, like, that, you know, a lot of people are supported by their um, religious communities and their decisions to terminate pregnancies. And even if they're not, that doesn't often come in conflict with their religious beliefs mm -hmm. uh, personally. Um, you know, there's this idea that, for example, Latinos are conservative because they're largely Catholic, and that means that they are more likely to be, you know, anti-abortion. But um, the National Institute for Latinas and Reproductive Justice actually did a polling, you know, did a study where they polled Latino voters in Texas, actually, and found that their views on abortion are much more complicated, despite the fact that they, many of them, identified as Catholic, that actually a lot of them said, you know, maybe I wouldn't 
choose to have an abortion for myself, but I would support a family member um, that decided to terminate a pregnancy, right? And so I think, you know, just to echo what you were saying, Katsia, that, you know, abortion is used in a, or religion is used in a very deliberate way to polarize um, rhetoric and even voting in terms of, of abortion, but that the way that people exercise their beliefs and make decisions is not always, doesn't line up that way. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi. thank you again for being here today. Um, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I'm curious, what would you say, why should this matter to young men who are here in the audience? Um, and, and what voice or what help could they have in this conversation? I mean, People, young men can, you know, have a lot to, um, there is a lot at stake in terms of reproductive justice for people that identify as men and people that can't get pregnant, for sure. Um, you know, uh, I think the first thing that comes to mind is kind of, um, you know, a lot of reproductive justice scholars have started to talk about um, mass incarceration as a reproductive justice mm -hmm. issue, both for women, women and people who get, can get pregnant who are incarcerated, but also for men. Young men of, co of color are a huge portion of people who are um, in um, carceral settings, and that is a reproductive justice issue if they have children, but also if they want to have families, mm -hmm. right? So that's one issue that I think is very clearly tied, right? That practices of criminalization and practices of incarceration um, impact, um, you know, people who identify as men um, directly, right? And that's, you know, also tied to ideas around criminalization, uh, ideas around criminality and, um, who's biologically, you know, more prone to criminal behaviors. Um, but also, you know, men have relationships with women who have the capacity to become pregnant, right? There's a lot at stake, I think. Um, but that was the first kind of thing that I thought of. Yeah, I think I, I'll name that not only women get abortions or need abortions and um, not all people that need abortions identify as women. So we are really explicit in our language when talking about people that need access to care and saying people or people who get pregnant mm -hmm. versus using women only language, which we see a lot in pro-choice spaces. And it's really important that we talk about, one, people that aren't women that need access to abortion. But also I think when we use a reproductive justice framework, we understand that access to abortion is connected to all these other things. And so whether or not you are someone that would need an abortion or not, you have stake in your ability to make decisions about your body and the person sitting next to you or your family or whoever. Um, so that would be my piece. There's a question down here. Oh, there's a few. Hi, thank you. Um, so my question was about how you all discussed about how despite um, Roe v. Wade making abortion legal at fe the federal level, um, it was also up to states locally, like how they wanted to go about abortion um, rights and reproductive rights. And so um, also it was discussed how culture plays a big role in like politics and political decisions. So my question was bearing these two points in mind, do you think the overturning of Roe v. Wade was a catalyst for states to make super restrictive abortion laws or was it something that was always going to happen? That's a great question. I mean, it was happening. States have been right. passing restrictions on abortion since the 90s, really. Um, and kind of on the flip side, Illinois was one of the states that passed protections because there were leaders that were like, we know that Roe is in trouble and so like many states Illinois had on the books that if Roe v. Wade was overturned, there was not a constitutional right in the state to abortion. We do have that now, but other states, when the decision came down, there were automatic trigger laws or automatic, you know, go back to some 1800s law that says that abortion is illegal. Um, so I think that Roe v. Wade wasn't, the fall of Roe v. Wade wasn't necessarily a catalyst for 
restrictions because they were happening before, but it has definitely, you know, it's been a win for anti-abortion people and that has fueled not only passage of anti-abortion restrictions, but also restrictions on gender affirming mm -hmm. care and attracts and attacks on trans and LGBT people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to be careful not to be heard as as suggesting that um, overturning Roe versus Wade, you know, was by any stretch of the imagination a good thing or helpful. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, if there is a silver lining. I think it, it it maybe has sort of awakened people who were sleeping to the very real threats to access that have been there all along and the ways in which abortion connects up to everything else that we're talking about today. Um, and so it, it, it maybe opens up some possibilities for reimagining what a stronger legal and cultural framework for reproductive justice might look like. Um, it's not exactly the, the question that you asked, but I think your question kind of raised for me this possibility that maybe going forward with the kind of activism and ballot initiatives that we're seeing, the kind of community organizing, the kind of mobilization, that maybe we can, over time, um, move to a place that was far better than what we kind of mm -hmm. had when we had Roe. Okay, um, thank you again for being here. Uh, you've all explained, and really eloquently I might add, the numerous ways reproductive restriction feeds a capitalist society, uh, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. I'd like to know what are some of the ways you think reproductive freedom would lead towards a more equitable society and close that gap as a whole? I mean, I, I, I think that the idea of reproductive freedom um, kind of is, is a way to um, make real equal citizenship, right? And so <laughs> the reproductive justice lens that we have been describing up here, I think, takes into account so many of these unjust social structures that if we start to attack them through the lens of reproductive justice, we're also getting at you know, other seemingly unrelated injustices that, you know, that, that we see all around us and um, leads us toward a more um, egalitarian, as you said, society. So it really is kind of a, a way in to a lot of the injustices that, you know, different social movements that maybe don't, um, on the face of it, align neatly with reproductive justice. Well, there are these synergies and these intersections, and I think we start to see them when we, when we really push the reproductive justice agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, for instance, the climate movement yeah. is intimately it's a great linked example. to reproductive justice, but you don't see that yeah. if we only talk about reproductive rights, right. which sounds like an individual endowment as opposed to a new lens on mm -hmm. power, yeah. I mean, if we go back to kind of like the earlier, we were talking about how economists say like, oh, contraception is like, has this direct link to increasing women's rights, right? Um, but if we take kind of like a reproductive, what would reproductive, what would that look like in a reproductive justice lens? What would reproductive freedom mean for families? And, and if we wanna talk about like women's rights, right? Like an, another version of that would be, you know, not that preventing pregnancies increases someone's economic possibilities, um, but that actually creating a supportive system for families and, and people, single um, mothers, single parents to um, support their children mm -hmm. um, to, you know, stay home and take care of their children if they want to or to go and work a job if they want to, like that's actually what you know, could better people's economic situations, not merely prevent them from having children so that they can engage in a, a often a low wage exploitative labor market, right? And so I think that's where the, the lens really shifts the narrative, right? Like, no, let's not focus on making people available to work, let's focus on getting them the supports they need to have their families flourish and work as well if they choose to, right? So what changes do you guys want made on the federal level? 
if you guys had absolute power, what would you do? <laughs> and I should say, and you have 60 seconds to oh. answer that question. <laughs> we could get rid of the Hyde Amendment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one. It's, you know, it's a bit of it, but very concrete. Yes. And took five seconds for me to answer. <laughs> 55 left. Go. <laughs> yeah, a constitutional right to bodily autonomy. <laughs> I, would, I would tear it all down. That would be my right. approach if I had absolute power, so yeah. Yeah, I think a constitutional right to reproductive autonomy, sexual autonomy, bodily autonomy, yep. Can I take five more seconds to say yeah. the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment? We yes. could get that on the books. That would help. That's right. <laughs> yes. Please join me in thanking Kitsia Sharif, Deborah Turkheimer, and Natalie Lira for this really wide-ranging conversation. Thank, oh, you, thank you so much. Thank you. <sighs> All right. That's a good question. I don't think I've ever been like, if I had unlimited power, right. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I would hand it over right. to someone. Right. <laughs>